It is Tuesday, November 28th, and this is The National. Tonight, why scientists around the world are watching this volcanic eruption in Bali so closely. Another dangerous act of defiance by North Korea. What these missile tests tell us about the secretive regime. But we begin with an emotional apology in the House of Commons. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called it this country's collective shame, how gay and lesbian Canadians were treated for decades. And so he stood in the House and apologized for the actions previous governments took against them simply because of their sexuality. It was a moment that was historic and moving. Over our history, laws, policies enacted by the government led to the legitimization of much more than inequality. They legitimized hatred and violence and brought shame to those targeted. The state orchestrated a culture of stigma and fear around LGBTQ2 communities and in doing so destroyed people's lives. It is with shame and sorrow and deep regret for the things we have done that I stand here today and say we were wrong, we apologize, I am sorry, we are sorry. The apology was supported by all parties, although some Conservative MPs did not attend. Ottawa also introduced legislation to wipe out the criminal records of those who were convicted of consensual same-sex activity, and the government settled a lawsuit with those in the public service, the military, and the RCMP in the Cold War era who were fired for being gay. $110 million has now been set aside to compensate those whose careers were sidelined. Dozens of people who were wronged by government policy were invited to Parliament Hill. We caught up with one man who traveled across the country to hear the government say sorry. I was the head of a department in a destroyer. I was a naval lieutenant. Frank Letourneau's story isn't an uncommon one. A rising star in the Royal Canadian Navy, at just 26 years old, he led a team of 40 sailors aboard the HMCS Saguenay. Here he is in 1968, speaking to Radio-Canada. Two years later, Le Tourneau's career abruptly ended when he was confronted by his superiors. I'd been summoned to the uh, military police office and they presented me with a file that suggested uh, that I led a homo you know, secretly a homosexual lifestyle. Le Tourneau came from Halifax for this and invited guests of the government to hear an apology for the way he was treated all those many years ago. But how do you feel about what happened to you? Well, I think it was a total waste uh, on the part of the government and the part of the Navy to uh, let go someone who had performed well and who had a good career ahead of him. Furthermore, a francophone. There, there, yeah. The Navy did not have a lot of francophones yeah. uh, at, that sport, at that stage. Uh, so, uh, so, so that was probably my dominant uh, thinking. Uh, I was also thinking, okay, what am I going to do now? So the fact that they are doing this today, could you have imagined all those years ago, 1970 was when it happened, right? That, that this day would come, that things would change this much uh, never in my wildest dreams. Uh, this is just a, uh, and you know, to have heard uh, uh, the Prime Minister Ali, Pierre Elliott Trudeau sort of talk about you know the bedroom uh, of the nation and uh, and so on, and now his son uh, about to issue a, a very broad apology from what we what we're expecting, and, and this is just uh, almost miraculous. And also maybe necessary. Le Tourneau picked up his life and moved forward. He says others did not fare as well. Indeed, all. Canadians missed out on important contributions you could have, would have made to our society. You were not bad soldiers, sailors, airmen and women. You were not predators, and you were not criminals. I know you're not a kind of guy to cry, <laughs> but did you have a moment there where you thought, oh. He hit it, well, yes, I, I suppose I did, you know, so he, it became personal at that point. I, I, I thought he was speaking to me specifically. It related to what had happened to me as someone who was really willing to serve the country loyally and, and competently, uh, who suddenly was being uh, told that uh, he didn't measure up anymore. Does anything feel different now? Like, do you feel different at all? Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just happy that, uh, that uh, the government has done this. Uh, we've been waiting for it for a long time, and uh, it, from, from my perspective, uh, it, it was, what was done today was impressive. Thousands of federal workers were fired from the 1950s to as late as the 90s, as part of what many have come to call the gay purge, a dark chapter in Canada's history. I think by getting it out in the open and discussing homosexuality is a very, very grave problem indeed. I think this was not so thing. long ago. Do you think that they are in any way a danger to our society? I believe uh, they are. A time when homosexuality was considered not only to be a criminal act, but a mental Anybody illness. Else? I think they should be locked up. You think that they should be put away? Do you think that they are uh, uh, a danger, a menace? Yes, definitely. Changes began slowly, starting in 1967, when Pierre Trudeau, then Justice Minister, introduced massive changes to the criminal code. There's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, and I think that, uh, you know, what's done in private between adults uh, doesn't concern the criminal code. Those famous words resonated loudly, and two years later, homosexuality was formally decriminalized. But societal change would take much longer. If a number of homosexuals get control of a, of a particular area of a government department, then to be promoted you have to be a homosexual. It becomes a, a little society of its own. With the Cold War looming large, many in the government of the day considered LGBT people as a threat to public security, fearing they could be blackmailed by Soviets into giving up government secrets. People were followed, pictures taken, interrogated about their private lives. An RCMP unit called Section A3 embarked on a mission to suss out and remove all gays from the civil service. They were showing naked or semi-naked images of women and men. Even developing a device to test for homosexuality known as the fruit machine. If the pupil dilated um, when they were being shown a naked image of someone of the same gender, that this was an indicator that they were actually homosexual. Not surprisingly, the machine never did work, but the damage was done. The gay purge ruined lives and careers. And it didn't end until 1992. That's when the military began accepting openly gay Canadians. 25 years later, today's apology shows just how far the country has come. But as Catherine Cullen tells us, some say there's still lots of work to do. It is our collective shame that you were so mistreated. It was a profound it moment, watching the apology, apology in a military so armory. And not just for people directly affected. Gemma Hickey never lost a job or got arrested for being transgender, but this still felt personal. As uh, an activist that's been out in the public, I have uh, received death threats. I've had to involve police. I've been spit on. I've had my property damaged. So um, for the Prime Minister of Canada to stand up and apologize, um, you know, I really felt that in my heart today. But what happens now? It is my hope that we will look back on today as a turning point. But there is still much more work to do ahead of us. You know, the apology is uh, a first step. It's a very big step. We've only scratched the surface. Hickey has fought for gender-neutral birth certificates and says in much of the country, that battle continues. Well, as it stands right now, non-binary individuals are invisible. We can't forget our past. People watching the apology in Toronto had other concerns. I think we really need to focus on the experiences of young people um, who may not have their parental support uh, for their identities. I would say one of those big ones for me would be end the blood ban for gay folks. In the last election, the Liberals called the ban on blood donations from men who had sex with men discriminatory and pledged to end it. Two years later, the government is still funding new medical research aimed at getting the ban lifted. Am I happy where we are? No. Do we have more work to do? Yes. And that's why our government stepped up to make sure the funding is there so that we can follow the science and get this work done. Work to do after absorbing the weight of today's embrace. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. It wasn't all nonpartisan support in the House today. It's Ottawa, after all. The opposition went after Bill Morneau about a 2015 sale of stock in his family business. That was days before he made a motion to raise taxes on high-income earners. The value of the shares dropped, and the insinuation by the opposition is that Morneau somehow benefited. He responded today by threatening a lawsuit. The opposition clearly has no idea how the stock market works. If they'd like a lesson on how the stock market works, of course, I'm happy to give it to them. But I can say with absolute certainty, if they want a lesson in how the legal system works, 
They just need to take those allegations outside the House, and I'll give it to them. And of course, Adrian, that's because outside of the House, you no longer have the protection of parliamentary privilege. Got it. Rosemary, we are watching the fallout of another dangerous act of defiance by North Korea tonight, a missile that crashed into the Sea of Japan. But that missile was really a message, and it had the rest of the world on alert. North Korea launched it in the middle of the night after months of relative quiet, and it went further than anything they've ever fired before. This is the missile's estimated trajectory. It looks almost impossible, 4,500 kilometers up. For reference, the space station orbits at about 400 kilometers. So why so high? The North Koreans are trying to make a point. 4,500 kilometers up translates to about 13,000 kilometers laterally. This missile had the capacity to hit L.A., Toronto, or New York. Donald Trump had this to say. We will take care of it. We have General Mattis in the room with us, and uh, we've had a long discussion on it. It is a situation that we will handle. It went higher, frankly, than any previous shot they've taken. It's a research and development effort on their part to continue building ballistic missiles that could threaten uh, everywhere in the world. South Korea responded by launching its own missiles in a show of force and joining a chorus of global condemnation. Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland and U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson have announced that Canada and the U.S. will co-host a conference on the North Korean threat in Canada early next year. It's a meeting that's been in the works since September. Asia correspondent Sasha Petrosik is in Beijing, where it is already Wednesday. So, Sasha, it's been, what, two and a half months since North Korea last launched a ballistic missile. What do you make of that gap? Well, that really does have some observers stumped. It could be that Pyongyang was just feeling uh, an accumulation of insults from Donald Trump, from his speeches and tweets, and from being put on the uh, international list of state sponsors of terror. Or it could have been simply that North Korea needs to keep testing if it wants to become the nuclear power that it insists it is going to be. Also, you know, I know we've been reading that normally these launches are at dawn. This one was in the middle of the night. Any idea why? Yeah, that was puzzling. Uh, this is uh, really a first. It could be that this was the result of uh, uh, fears from Pyongyang that the Americans might try to interfere with this launch. They've been running their bombers and fighter jets up and down the coast uh, as a show of force. They might have wanted to do it under the cover of darkness. Or it could have been a technical issue. Some technical experts have suggested that by firing this thing at uh, nighttime, like they might do in a real situation, uh, it would give the rockets an extra boost to make it to the east coast of the United States, which would be the target, but the rockets aren't quite ready to go there yet. Okay, entirely possible. Asia correspondent Sasha Petrosik in Beijing. Thanks. It was pretty clear North Korea was up to something. Satellites spotted movement of materials over the last 48 hours. Yesterday, South Koreans reported missile tracing radar was switched on at a North Korean base. Slivers of evidence are all you can glean from a country that, from space, is as dark as it is isolated. So how do we know what North Korea is really up to? That's our question of the day. Some look for answers in the sea. The sea is a far better place for North Korea to get access to these materials. It's murkier, it's harder to track. Robert Hewish of Dalhousie University has recently seen ships stop broadcasting their location right as they near North Korean waters. He suspects some vessels are trying to skirt the sanctions in the name of keeping North Korea's nuclear program functioning. To have any sort of aggressive weapons program that involved nuclear material or intercontinental ballistic missiles, you require fuel, you require resources, you require parts, you even require computer programs. There are so few boats actually entering North Korean waters, the list of suspects just got a lot smaller. Then there are the images North Korea releases on purpose. It's pumped up propaganda. Only sometimes in those pictures, there is intel likely leaked out by accident. Scott LaFoy is an imagery analyst with a specialty in missile programs. We went to him because in the blur of propaganda, he sees what the rest of us don't. 
In July of last year, uh, Kim Jong-un oversaw the launch of several Scud missiles. He oversaw the launch of these missiles from a highway um, that was basically two-lane highway, uh, split down the middle with shrubbery. And then his camo tent, he very frequently will travel with this tent with screens up to protect uh, the location that he's at, makes it harder for him to be found, makes it harder for people like us or governments to predict where he is going to be for the next test. But there is a small yellow uh, signature that showed up, uh, and this yellow stripe is a hazard marker, a hazard marker from a tunnel. And there's only a few places in North Korea that ha have both this kind of hazard marker and this type of road. So we narrowed it down to about three locations, four locations he possibly could be in, and one that he very likely was in, the site. It helps us predict how, how their missiles work and sort of what level of technology they're at. In this case, it showed us they have increased mobility with their missile systems and that they are not locked in place, which allows us to sort of predict where, in the event of war, what their operational area would look like. The imagery may even be able to reveal who is helping North Korea. Have a look at these engines, specifically what's known as their plumbing. Lafoy says the designs echo those of the former Soviet Union. And those two tubes on this North Korean missile truck, awfully similar to a famous Russian ICBM truck. Now, it's not proof. These are educated hunches from analysts hanging on to every pixel, every sound from the hermit nation. And you have to know, Andrew, that, that one thing we know for sure is that with each new test, there is always a new burst of imagery to analyze, and they are waiting for it. Yeah, a whole new set of implications. Well, an Ontario man accused in a massive hack of Yahoo email accounts pleaded guilty today in a U.S. court. 22-year-old Karim Baratov was arrested last spring. Prosecutors accused him of helping Russian intelligence officers to carry out a cyber attack that affected 500 million Yahoo accounts. Baratov faces a maximum of 10 years in prison. Well, with all the talk of fake news in the U.S. these days, the stakes are high on all sides for mainstream news organizations and also for those looking to undermine their credibility. That tension was highlighted in a Washington Post expose that has a lot of people talking tonight. It was a scheme aimed at duping the Post into printing a false story. Paul Hunter looks at an escalating war on journalism itself. In this case, evidently, it backfired. Okay. Sorry to have brought you all the way out here. Okay. An apparent attempt by the woman on the right to pass on an ugly and intentionally false story to the reporter on the left about Republican Senate contender Roy Moore, aimed at embarrassing the paper. But the Post had too many questions in return. Well, I guess you'd call it a botched sting. The goal, of course, was to then, after the story would have been published, to expose it as false uh, and therefore discredit uh, our previous reporting on allegations against Roy Moore and then also cast doubt on any future claims that might be made against the, uh, the would-be senator. It was the Post that first reported Moore is an alleged child molester turning his run for the Senate on its ear. How better to deflect attention on that than to discredit those who told the story. In the U.S. these days, it's become almost a thing. The same group said to have targeted the Post, conservative-backed Project Veritas, this summer secretly recorded a CNN producer commenting on coverage of Russian meddling in last year's election. It's mostly bullshit right now. Like, we don't have any big, giant proof. The White House jumped on it. Uh, if the media can't be trusted to report the news, then that's a dangerous place for America. Like other videos published by Veritas, the CNN clip was quickly debunked. The producer didn't even cover politics. True or untrue, it's all part of what's become a familiar and powerful refrain. You are fake news. You know, I like real news, not fake news. You're fake news. The fake news, the enemy of the people. And they are. Leaving just they enough are. voters and to wonder, right or wrong, and who to believe, passed, except when it pass, doesn't work. On MSNBC on this summer, a warning from Rachel Maddow that her show had just discovered they'd been approached with fake documents, a trap, she called it. We don't know who's doing it, but we're working on it. One lesson 
my hope is that it's a reminder of the care that reporters take in pursuing these kinds of stories. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it does mean that we are not uh, just printing accusations uh, willy-nilly without any vetting. In other words, turns out the mainstream media knows how to do its job. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So remember a certain engagement announcement yesterday? Well, today many British media have spent the whole day on a not-so-critical task, figuring out what Prince Harry and Meghan Markle were saying when the mics were turned off. Some even hired lip readers. Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, thank you both very much. Thank, thank you, you so much. There are a few minutes of outtakes of the couple laughing and chatting with no sound. There's no consensus on what this joke was about. But here, apparently, the prince jokes about Markle always interrupting him, and Markle responds with a teasing show of listening intently. And the details of the wedding day have started to emerge. St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle will be the venue. It holds about 800 guests. The wedding day will be sometime in May, and the royal family will pay for the core elements of the ceremony and reception. There will be a few big changes for Markle. She will be baptized into the Church of England before the wedding day, and she will become a UK citizen right afterwards. Certainly a talker. <laughs> okay, still ahead on The National. Thousands of travelers trapped, and people are being told to get out. Why scientists are worried that volcano in Bali could blow soon. Plus, daring the government, the fight over lucrative lobsters and what defines a livelihood in Nova Scotia. And vacancy rates in Canada's biggest cities are next to zero. We have stories of young people who cannot find a place to live. I had an amazing life in Vancouver, and when it got to the point where I couldn't have an, an amazing life there, I left. On the national tonight, a development on North Korea's latest missile launch that we just told you about a few moments ago. The state broadcaster is speaking about it, announcing just this past hour that this was their most powerful missile yet. They also say it was tipped with a, quote, super large heavy warhead. It ended up splashing down into the Sea of Japan. Well, we're also keeping a close eye on Bali tonight, where Mount Agung is threatening to blow. It's technically already erupting, spewing volcanic ash thousands of meters into the air. But with what locals are calling rays of fire sweet seeping out, they're worried that it could explode. A hundred thousand people near that volcano have been told to get out. Some wind up in makeshift shelters like this one. But Others are staying put, refusing to leave their homes. There are Canadians there too, many of them stranded because flights off the island have all been canceled. One friend that we have here is getting on a bus at 6 a.m. He's gonna drive 18 hours, apparently through a jungle, there's a swamp, there's some sort of canoe or a boat that's gonna take him to an island where you know there might be an airport that might still be open. At this point, you're trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. Do you, do you sit tight and hope that you know, the worst of it is over, or is it actually going to erupt and we should get the heck out of here as soon as possible? Now, worth noting here, volcanoes come in lots of different shapes and sizes, and turns out this one is particularly dangerous. We asked our own seismologist and scientist, Johanna Wagstaff, to tell us why. Mount Agung is a stratovolcano, meaning it's cone-shaped. Those can produce the most violent explosions. Imagine all of the magma deep within is heating up water and creating pressure that's building towards a small point at the top of the volcano. Its steep slopes can send lava rushing down the mountainside at high speeds. And we know how deadly that is because we've seen it before. The last time this volcano blew was in 1963. More than a thousand people died, most of them because of the blast and lava. The other danger is mud flows. When the earth shakes, so much can break loose. And with all that rock and debris spewing out, rain can turn that into fast-flowing rivers, destroying everything in its path. And Johanna's here to tell us more about the impact, because, Joe, how wide of an area are we actually talking here that's under direct threat from that volcano? 
Well, Andrew, the evacuation radius is about 12 kilometers from the volcano. That's based on topography as well as the ash cloud that is a threat to planes. Not everyone in the evacuation zone, though, has left. Uh, some people are just wearing masks and hope, for, and hope that when an eruption does happen, they can make it out in time. And is it a foregone conclusion that the volcano will erupt in a giant explosion? Not necessarily. Uh, there is a scenario where the gas may just release uh, gradually over a longer period of time. So scientists are watching signs and clues very closely. One of them is earthquakes. We can tell that the magma is getting closer to the surface based on earthquake activity. We're also monitoring and measuring the temperature of the gases that are being released to see, again, if that magma is getting closer to the surface. Uh, so all signs are pointing towards a major eruption, even though it isn't a done deal, but these are all the same clues we had before the 1963 eruption, Andrew. Okay, Johanna Wagstaff, thanks so much. You're welcome. Coming up, Nova Scotia's lucrative lobster industry opened again today. First Nations fishermen can catch enough for a moderate livelihood. But what is that? We know what it's not. We know what poverty looks like with 80% of First Nation communities in Nova Scotia living below the poverty line. We know what it's not. The battle over hundreds of millions of dollars. That's later on The National. And up next, we'll have the lowdown on sky-high rent in Canadian cities, which has made apartment hunting sobering and too often literally smelly. One room I looked at was covered in bird excrement, and that was $800 a month, and she wanted a caretaker for her bird as well. This is one of the nicer rooms I've seen. I mean, I've looked at some really awful places and it has a floor and a desk and a bed. It's lovely. You're hearing Sharna Ridge there. She's a young professional, a new arrival to Toronto, taking stock of her rental options. And if you get the feeling that those options aren't great, check out the latest numbers from the CMHC. The average rent in Canada blasting upwards at twice the rate of inflation, now sitting at $947 a month. But as with everything in real estate, location matters. This is what your average two-bedroom costs in Vancouver and Toronto. And rental vacancy rates in those two cities sit at about 1%. In Alberta and Quebec, it's a bit more reasonable, but in many urban centres, this isn't even close to a renter's market. That dream house has been soaring out of reach for a while, and now that nice apartment is starting to look like a fantasy too. Jacqueline Hansen has more on the no-vacancy reality. Um, it's a bit of a, a, a funny smell. Is everything OK or with the room? Or that voice is 27-year-old Sharna Ridge. She thinks the Sorry? smell is urine. I was just asking, is there a plumbing issue? There's a bit of a, a smell. The cost to live here, $650 a month. Down there, is that more rooms? Ridge filmed this for us to show what it's been like trying to find a room to rent. One room I looked at was covered in bird excrement and that was $800 a month and she wanted a caretaker for her bird as well. This is basement room. At her temporary <laughs> sublet, she showed us more. So to have this room for $500, that's considered almost lucky. The bed barely fits in it. Yeah. Do I want to live in a shoebox and just barely live at all, really? <laughs> Housing is becoming unattainable. As Toronto's former chief city planner, Jennifer Keysmat knows the city's weak spots well but also its powerful draws. Jobs, cultural opportunities, diversity, and where it's growing, like this neighborhood. There are more buildings going up here than in all of Boston. But at the same time, we're not actually seeing those units becoming more and more affordable. It used to be that when we talked about affordable housing, we actually worried about social housing. Really what we're talking about today is people who are um, able to be fully employed, but are not able to afford housing. We are missing an entire housing type in our city right now. Housing rights are human rights. The main focus of the government's new 10-year national housing strategy is social housing. And that's an important starting point, according to Keysmat. But she also wants to see faster access to more affordable rentals. We cannot recognize the urgency of this situation enough. Downtown Toronto, it's hard to go far without coming across a high rise under construction or 
plans for more posted like this. But most of these buildings are condos and the average unit costs more than half a million dollars and rents for more than 2000. It's not just Toronto that's becoming less attainable. Vancouver's reputation for its great quality of life is being overshadowed by its affordability crisis. I honestly was so burnt out on every level um, by the time I left Vancouver that I needed to I needed to be with my family. Let me get ni nice and savory. Jessica Barrett is taking a break here in Edmonton well, on her stuff. way to start a new life in Calgary. She spent 15 years in Vancouver, yeah. first as a student, then as a journalist. I would have to keep freelancing um, on the side on top of a very demanding full-time job just to make up, you know, the rent. Barrett wrote about a city at risk of losing its young, vibrant professionals like her, but feeling defeated, she left. Are we really going to be okay with a society in which Anybody who has a young family or is a teacher or a social worker or a journalist or an artist can't afford to live there, like, you're just gonna be okay with that. I try to get like the pictures of the CN Tower, the skylines of Toronto, just because it reflects the you made it mindset in the big city. Bibin Joseph is 24 years old. He's optimistic that Toronto is still a city of possibilities. I tell people the reason I want to move to Toronto is because it's the New York of Canada. Even though the first room for rent he could find. It was, was what's the word I'm looking for? It's probably like a chaos. Uh, I didn't expect there to be around eight to 10 people staying in one big house. His room is cramped and it smells of heavy smoke, someone else's. Joseph wants to get out. I've been telling my friends, they say, hey, how was Toronto? Do you enjoy it? I was like, honestly, all I've been doing is working and look at our places. <laughs> so that's all I've been doing. I miss Edmonton a lot more now because I left a lot of comforts to come to a city where I'm struggling. The prosperity that we see as a country and in our cities is at risk if we do not address housing affordability, particularly in Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, I don't want to go home because I'm homeless due to a housing crisis. I'll never say like I'll go move back to Edmonton because I feel like I lost in Toronto. Um, and I have this attitude like to never give up. I had an amazing life in Vancouver and when it got to the point where I couldn't have an, an amazing life there, I left. All determined to find a home, but only willing to sacrifice so much. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News. Toronto. That song, Despacito, bore a hole through speakers this year. You're welcome for that earworm. One version of the video was the most viewed on YouTube ever, and thanks to Justin Bieber's vocal contributions to the song, he is now up for two Grammys, one of more than a dozen Canadians listed as nominees for the 60th annual Grammy Awards. I'm leaving the table. I'm out of the game. Hard to say what the late legend Leonard Cohen would think of his two nominations, but he is in this game. So too are some newcomers, like Toronto R&B artist Daniel Caesar, who's up for two. There are the usual suspects, of course. The Weeknd has a chance to snag another Grammy for his collection. And Brampton, Ontario native Alicia Cara is up for four Grammys. Just a few on an impressive list. Of course, on January 28th, we'll see which of these nominees actually closes the deal. It's dumping day in southwestern Nova Scotia. That means thousands of commercial fishermen can set their traps and open the lobster season. But a stunning day on the water masks a serious dispute involving a big number. $493 million. That was the value of last year's catch here. 
the second highest ever in this, Canada's richest lobster fishing area. A lot at stake, so it really matters who is allowed to fish and how, and that's where the dispute comes in, putting First Nations against non-Indigenous fishermen in a fight that has boiled over. Tom Murphy went dockside to find out how and if it can be solved. The woman behind the wheel of that car, she's on a mission. If I don't do something now, if I don't, nobody else is doing anything. That's Cheryl Maloney, a mother, a Mi'kmaq, a law school graduate, and someday she hopes a fish boat captain. I have a, a young boys that, you know, we wanted them to enter the fishery under our treaty rights. It's so important. She wants her family to earn what the courts have said the Mi'kmaq are entitled to, a moderate livelihood, which to Maloney simply means a decent living. Problem is, Ottawa and the First Nations can't agree on what it is. This is her personal quest to push the government to once and for all define what a moderate livelihood really is. We know what it's not. We know what poverty looks like with 80% of First Nation communities in Nova Scotia living below the poverty line, we know what it's not. And for the government to continuously try to use that definition or what that definition means, um, it's a further um, violation of our, our Aboriginal rights and our human rights. So instead of waiting for that, maybe that's something we'll test. Maybe we'll go fishing and they want to test what moderate livelihood means. We've been winning hundreds and hundreds of cases. We will win in court again. It's why Maloney is looking to buy a boat and go fishing without a license, whether Ottawa likes it or not. Entering into a serious game of dare you with DFO to bring this matter back before the courts. There are plenty who don't like what Maloney and others like her are doing. They call them poachers. Patience is running low, tension is high. Already two boats, one of them indigenous, the other one non-indigenous, have been set on fire. Frustrated fishermen gather en masse in silent protest at DFO offices, many fearing to speak out. <laughs> I don't know. No one wants their boat to be next. So they catch a few lobsters? Oh yeah, we caught a few lobsters. Yeah, we did a what did you get? Day. Well, you get we some? got our quota for each, right? First Nations already have limited access to the commercial fishery, and they can also fish a small amount any time of year for something called food, social, and ceremonial purposes. Basically for feasts and special events back at the reserves. Something Michael Peter Petipa says he does. Now are these food and ceremonial? Yeah, these are food ceremonial. These are going home. I put them in storage till I make the trip home. Will you sell them? No, no, no. Those are for those are for us. So but you're you're allowed under the law. And there's no rot problem with you no, fishing no, these lobsters right now. They can come right in now. here. The the DFO. They come here. They can inspect them. They can uh, have free will at my lobsters. The Mi'kmaq are not allowed to sell those food, social, and ceremonial lobsters, but some are in large amounts in a black market. Uh, we're trying to make a moderate living, but they ain't gonna allow us. Or trying to. But I'm going to be making a living because I'm going to fight to make to the end myself. Would you like to get it back in court again and have a... Oh, I'm going there. There's no two ways about it. This fall, DFO set up a sting operation, inserting microchips and lobsters in multiple illegal traps. It led to the seizure of three tons of those lobsters. You they want to fish fish and cheese, like food fisheries all right, but there, there's more than the food fishery going on. So, non-Indigenous fishermen ask, DFO, why aren't there more criminal charges? It's a big money fishery too, isn't it? The uh, lobster fishery is, is particularly lucrative. Uh, David Worley of DFO understands the frustration, but urges calm. And you don't want to get too caught up in charges there. I, mean, I think the, the measure of an effective enforcement program is compliance rather than the charge rate. Um, so, so there's been, a, I think, a good deal of, of education through the fall and the summer. I'm hoping that something good comes out of this and that it's, it's clearer as we move ahead. But what we saw this summer and this fall were non-native fishermen who were frustrated with you because they felt DFO wasn't enforcing the rules. That's true. We, we've heard that as well. Um, and in response to that, I'd say there's a, a few things. Um, 
there's a there's a view that that enforcement is is exclusively on the water work, um, and I think that the nature of enforcement is changing. Um, uh, enforcement has taken a balanced and a measured approach. The treaty gave them a new right to engage in a, a commercial fishery. Michael Donovan is a lawyer who has handled numerous Aboriginal cases and is watching all of this unfold. An arrest would get it before the courts, uh, which would probably start a process that would uh, take the next uh, five years or so. Um, I think if, there, if there's dissatisfaction with the way it's being administered now, uh, the best solution would be for uh, consultations and negotiations to take place between the federal government and, and the uh, Mi'kmaq bands. Might that explain why DFO might be reluctant to lay a charge? Possibly. If the uh, consultation takes place first, then you're not stuck in uh, a legal battle that goes on for years, only to find uh, that, yes, the way it's being handled now uh, violates a, uh, a treaty right. If a native fisherman takes lobster ashore, but does not have a commercial license and then tries to sell them, what will you tell your officers to do? Well, it's going to depend on the specific situation. Um, I mean, I think in general, it's a, it's a case of, of education um, around that. If, if anything meaningful was happening, somebody would be talking to me and saying, Cheryl, hold on. We're going to get you out there on the water. And you know? so as negotiations with Ottawa over what a moderate livelihood really is drag on, the tension remains. And Cheryl Maloney vows to keep making waves. Yeah, we're going to get out there fishing. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Sonyaville, yeah. Nova Scotia. The government has now taken a step. The minister has appointed a negotiator to help reconcile fisheries rights. Talks will include First Nations in the Maritimes and Quebec. Well, still ahead, is Toronto really a CFL town? We ask fans as they celebrate their Grey Cup. But first. I'm glad to be alive. I'm so glad. And everybody, first response team, I want to thank Search and Rescue, everybody in the community, just strangers. I, I'm just so glad to be alive. I'm just so happy. Annette Poitras is heading home after nearly a week in hospital. She was rescued after spending two nights lost in the BC wilderness. Poitras was walking three dogs when she tripped on a log and was not unconscious. But turns out one of those dogs helped get her out alive. Well, Ratsu was a big help. That's who uh, kept her warm at night. And, uh, you know, she was the one that uh, barked when the rescuers were close. Well, she was the one that got a hold of the, the SAR. Like, she was barking and barking. I was too weak. I couldn't call out. I was too weak. I saw that helicopter over and over and over again. And if I stayed one more night Thursday, I didn't think I was going to make it. Hey. On The National tonight, a celebration in Saskatoon to remember the life of Marlene Bird. It's one of several round dances being held across the country tonight in her honor. Bird was a residential school survivor who was so badly beaten back in 2014 that she was partially blinded and lost both of her legs. She died yesterday at the age of 50. The U.S. Air Force is facing legal action tonight in connection with that mass shooting at a Texas church early this month. The parents of one of the 26 victims filed a claim accusing the military of negligence. They say the military could have stopped gunman Devin Kelly from legally buying a gun, but that it failed to report his criminal record to a federal database. The Air Force won't comment. In a speech in Myanmar today, Pope Francis treaded very carefully around the Rohingya refugee crisis, refusing to say the word Rohingya at all. The future of Myanmar must be peace. Una peace fondata sul rispetto della dignità e dei diritti di ogni membro della società. A veiled reference to the ongoing crisis that has forced more than 600,000 Muslims out of the country. The Pope was advised not to refer to them by name in case it made the situation worse. Well, back to Ottawa, there were some tense moments in the House of Commons today after the Conservatives accused the government of going easy on suspected ISIS fighters returning to this country. 
So ISIS specifically trained Canadian fighters to come back here and terrorize our community, and the Liberals knew about it for over two years. So why is the Prime Minister so focused on reintegration services and not putting these people in jail? The fact is, we always focus on the security of Canadians, and we always will, and they play politics of fear, and Canadians reject that. Since the Liberals entered government, two Canadians have been charged with fighting for ISIS. Now, Toronto Argos fans had plenty to celebrate about this season today at the Grey Cup rally, including an unbelievable come-from-behind championship win. But when that team can only draw about half the fans of any of the Prairie squads, it demands the question, is Toronto really a CFL town? Ian, of course, went to find out. <laughs> There's a perception in other parts of the country that Torontonians aren't really big CFL fans. Oh, uh, I, I beg to differ that point. I think we're huge CFL fans. Um, we may be small, but we're very mighty. Uh, and we love the Argos being at BMO Field now. So you're a young man. I, yes. I, I keep hearing that young people aren't big CFL fans. Um, because, you know what, they're more NFL fans. NFL has gained the reputation, and it, it's just... It's just like the NBA. No, no one's watching the D League. However, me, myself as a fan, I watch it. Maybe because I'm a Canadian. So there's a feeling that people have in other parts of the country that Torontonians aren't big CFL fans. What, what do you think of that? I'm the biggest ever, and I'm defending the CFL everywhere. I had to tell people in Detroit Eatery that the NFL stinks. <laughs> Come over to our game. That's the National for November 28th. Good night, everybody. Right. Good night.